afternoon, everybody. So uh, Jenny's really raised the bar that this has to be exciting. So <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to talk specifically first about a uh, project that I was part of um, from 2011 to 2014. It was a USDA project to identify uh, methods for estimating greenhouse gas emissions and then to work with USDA to help them build a tool. And then following a little bit of uh, information about this project, we're actually going to bring up the other three panelists and they'll talk about tools that they've been working on. This particular tool followed a USDA greenhouse gas inventory. Um, the intent of this was to develop a report that quantified greenhouse gas fluxes in agriculture and forestry. Unlike some of the other tools that we're going to hear about later, this one was intended to address all species and not just uh, dairy. It's organized in uh, three sections, crops, livestock, and forestry. It was released a year ago. The tool was actually released three weeks ago, so I'll share that a little bit at the very end. Uh, I did go through internal stakeholder and public review periods, two public review periods over the three-year period. And the report shown here is electronically available, but hopefully by going through this, I can spare you the 500 plus pages <laughs> of reading it. And I do want to acknowledge uh, Marlon Eve. Um, he wasn't able to attend this meeting, but uh, he actually led the project on USDA's part. So as a result of the Food Conservation and Energy Act of 2008, USDA was directed to, quote, establish technical guidelines that outline science-based methods to measure the environmental services benefits from conservation and land management activities in order to facilitate the participation of farmers, ranchers, and forest land owner owners in emerging environmental services markets. And so this outlines pretty much who our audience was, although we certainly also wanted to be able to engage scientists in this. And to follow this mandate, then USDA enlisted the help of 40 scientists to author and 30 experts to provide scientific review of a technical methods report. And again, that work began in 2011 and the report was released a year ago. So the guidance we received for this document, and I was the lead author on the animal section, so I can't speak too knowledgeably about crops and forests, but I know a little bit about that from working with those lead authors. But across the board, we were given um, objectives of creating a standard set of greenhouse gas estimation methods that provide a framework for the development of this tool, uh, to establish a transparent and scientific basis for farm scale estimation of greenhouse gas impacts of management decisions, to address crop and grazing lands, manage wetlands, animal production, and manage forests, and then the users would primarily be landowners and others assessing the impact of changes in land management, conservation programs and practices, and the inventories. So in my perspective, the tool is really targeted at these audiences. Uh, the guidance document itself reads much more as a review of scientific literature. But uh, we are going to make this exciting nonetheless. <laughs> so um, within the uh, document, we looked at primary emission sources coming from enteric emissions, housing emissions, and then emissions from manure storage, as well as emissions from the crop and hay fields as it pertains to the dairy portion. We reviewed a number of available methods and documentation in order to identify what information we had that could actually be incorporated into this greenhouse gas tool. And we established 11 total criteria in evaluating models and estimates that were already available. Two of those criteria were considered essential, those being that the model be relevant to the U.S. climate and dairy systems, and that the model and all of the information behind it be publicly available. These are the other criteria that we had. Um, the model had to be based on sound relationships among farm management inputs and emission outputs. It had to be able to estimate methane, nitrous oxide, and ammonia emissions from housing. It had to have the flexibility to describe the variation that occurs within animal production systems around the country and even within a region. Had to be easy to use and use as easily obtained farm information. Uh, emission estimates for enteric methane and housing emissions had to be easily captured. The mitigation strategies within the model 
uh, had to be able to be incorporated into a model and have the ability to add mitigation strategies as they're developed. Had to be transparency in model calculations. Uh, it had to be validated with on-farm data and the model had to work reliably, meaning the program did not crash when we ran it. So we went through a series of models and what I'm gonna show you down in the asterisk part um, of each slide going forward is which equation was determined to be used in the model that was ultimately developed by USDA. So again, USDA didn't collect any data. They identified models that were already out there and equations already out there and incorporated those. So the guidance document talks about greenhouse gas emissions from enteric fermentation um, and the report provided methods for estimating the emissions. We felt it was critical that uh, the factors affecting emissions be incorporated in to the model and be able to account for um, variation, those being dry matter intake, diet composition, and dry matter digestibility. So ultimately, the guidance document uh, moved forward using the MITS equation, which is part of the dairy gem model, um, and applied that for est estimating methane emissions. From dairy housing, um, we concluded that most of the emissions of methane are going to primarily come from enteric emissions. Uh, there will be some ammonia that's lost within the housing, which downstream can contribute to nit nitrous oxide emissions. Uh, but the guidance document then proposed using the IPCC Tier 2 equation to estimate housing emissions. Uh, if the manure accumulates or the Chianese 2009 equation to estimate methane on barn floors. And the report also concluded that nitrous oxide was likely overestimated by IPCC Tier 2 for housing emissions because it's the same equation that's used for stockpiles where you're more likely to have a nitrous oxide accumulation. Also within uh, this guidance document and ultimately the tool, in order to estimate uh, nutrient composition and excretion from the dairy animals, uh, we proposed using ASAB D384.2 standard. From manure storage, we felt that the greenhouse gas emissions were uh, most likely driven from storage form, storage method, environmental conditions, particularly ambient, and then treatment practices. And so we felt that it was important to account for all of these in any tool that would be moved forward. The storage methods uh, that are discussed in the report include stockpiling, composting, anaerobic and aerobic lagoons, runoff ponds, and storage tanks. You'll notice from the asterisk though that uh, the IPCC tier two method was applied if there's a single asterisk, but if there's a double, the summer method was applied uh, for methane and nitrous oxide was estimated based on exposed surface area or US based emission factors. So a variety of sources of data were used throughout uh, this guidance document. Treatment practices are really important in trying to address and perhaps reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And so if you adjust the physical or chemical uh, nature, if you adjust the physical characteristics of manure or change the chemical or nutrient composition, then logically you could alter greenhouse gas emissions. And so the guidance document in recommends including sand or nutrient removal, solid liquid separation, thermochemical conversion technologies, wetland treatment, and methane capture and destruction. Note, however, that at the bottom, if there's an asterisk next to any of those, which there is besides all of them other than methane capture and destruction, we actually couldn't recommend a method for estimating greenhouse gas emissions based on the data that are available. So this then you'll see come up later as a knowledge gap that was identified. And I think this is really key as we're trying to encourage producers to be creative and go that step beyond, we've got to have the data to help them uh, support what they're doing. Also in looking at this, uh, volatile solids content often becomes very important in, in, in having that data and using it to estimate greenhouse gas emissions. Unfortunately, we don't readily have volatile solids content available for many of our dairy operations. And so that becomes another gap in the data that's available. As a result, we often recommend using default values, but when we do that, then we really lose that entity level estimation ability. 
So the greenhouse gas emissions from uh, land, uh, the committee felt that changes in management of cropland, grazing land, managed wetlands, and land application of manure influenced greenhouse gas emissions, biomass, and soil carbon stock changes. Uh, the grazing land and cropland changes, of course, are most relevant to the dairy industry. In the summary of those different practices, IPCC tier one, two, or three equations were recommended for incorporation into a model in all of these cases. And I, I can help you find, if you're interested in which tier was recommended for each of those, I can lead you to that information. The cropland management practices that are addressed in the report and recommended to be incorporated into a model to be developed would include nutrient additions from both manure and commercial fertilizers, uh, irrigation, lime application, tillage practices, residue management, following fields, foraging crop selection, reserve acreage, and erosion control practices. From the grazing land practices, much of these same practices were recommended for incorporation. And so I'll let you read those yourself. And then at the uh, end of the report, uh, we were asked to put together a list of key knowledge gaps, and I've alluded to some of those. Some of the others was that uh, we felt that there needs to be an opportunity to expand options to improve site specificity. Certainly the report did not address everything that's going on on every farm. We already were are data limited in addressing some of them that we know are already going on. We need to be able to do that. Similarly, we need to be able to increase mitigation options and how they're incorporated into models. Uh, one of the key things is we need to be able to explore interactive effects of multiple strategies. And even within the model that was ultimately developed, uh, there's an inability to look at multiple species within a single site. Um, so that there's a gap there because we know there's a lot of operations that do have more than one species. Also, if you're using a combination of practices, we're not sure what the synergistic effect is and that's not reflected in the model. We also identified a gap in the data that was available for the non-milking animals in a herd. And so we potentially overestimate then what's coming off from the site if it's raising all of its young stock by not having good data for uh, dry cows and young stock. And then we felt uh, that we needed to be able to improve the database of manure management characteristics and the resulting emissions. By using just the ASA E ABE data, we could use a diet-based approach because of the way those equations work, uh, but certainly we need greater opportunity to validate how accurate those equations are now that it's almost 10 years since they were first developed. Um, also, we need to be able to have a data base that really reflects storage time, environmental conditions, and loading rate in manure storage systems. And then we strongly recommended that there needs to be a consistent, reliable method for measuring practice effectiveness across the board uh, so that we're comparing apples to apples. So uh, about three weeks ago, USDA released this model. It's called Comet Farm. Some of you might be familiar with Comet BR, which was sort of a predecessor. Comet Farm takes uh, the recommendations from the document and incorporates those equations into uh, this model. My understanding is what was released a few weeks ago is what they're calling a soft release. And so they're looking for people to voluntarily run through the model, use it, and provide feedback on that before they make further modifications on this. So it is available. Uh, you can Google Comet Farm and access it. It does go through things asking you for like your GPS coordinates or your zip code uh, for field level res resolution. Um, I've gone through it only on the animal side and it's fairly user friendly uh, to get through. So with that, I'll take any questions related to this report. I do also want to acknowledge um, a number of the co-authors particularly Wei Lau at Michigan State, who was very involved in putting together manure management section of the report. Uh, Chris Johnson, Andy Cole, and April Latham, who were very involved in putting together the enteric methane portions of that. And then ICF was the contractor who oversaw the, the coordination of the report itself. So 
with that, we've got a couple of minutes before we assemble our panel, if there's any questions.